Welcome back. I'm Alfred Lamarant Weber, and we have an extraordinary uh, guest experience and introduction today. Uh, Karen Holton and I have been doing shows together now, and we're very similar in our approach and in our missions. And Karen is here in a initially a two-part series to really introduce us to her world, uh, how she got started, what that transformation was, and how that blossomed into her mission, and what the many things she has to offer our awakening community. So Karen, over to you. Thank you, Alfred. It's indeed a great pleasure to be here. I enjoy your show so much. I rarely miss an episode, so I just really appreciate the fact that you let me be on your show today. I've got quite a bit of information. Um, I'm going to just give everyone a bit of an overview. I want to warn your viewers that the first half of this presentation will be fairly dark. I want to talk about how uh, prior to my spiritual awakening, I worked for 10 years as an anti-poverty activist. We knew this new world order thing was coming and we did all kinds of things to try to stop it. And I want to get into a little bit of that. Then um, when I went to university, I got a degree in social work and I didn't go in for child apprehension or anything like that. I took all the fringe courses. I learned everything. I'm in Canada. So my perspective is going to be Canadian. And it's also going to be from a British Columbia perspective because that's where I lived for quite a long time before I more recently uh, relocated to Alberta. So um, with that being said, I want to talk a little bit about what I learned pre-contact to present uh, Canadian history from the alternative perspectives, which means from the perspectives of women, from the perspective of the First Nations, especially the First Nations women, perspective from the disabled, perspective from all the different groups that are not your mainstream white middle class society. So um, I continued my anti-poverty work until I got thoroughly brutalized by the members of the Victoria Police Department when I was participating in a peaceful demonstration. And I went, no, 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 I'm getting too old for this shit. I can't, I can't do that part. There must be something else I can do. And it really wasn't long after that that I had um, and by the way, my spiritual awakening has come in, in several different layers. So I had a profound spiritual awakening after uh, completing university, and I saw the whole world differently, and I started communicating quite easily and prolifically with all kinds of beings, extraterrestrials, angels, ancestors, it was a really amazing experience. But from there, I got to the point where I then received a download from my spiritual non-corporeal brothers and sisters, although they don't have gender at that point, um, but the ETs do. And it's a long story, but um, I received a download. And I was asked to downstep the information because the download came in an instant, but it was so much information that it took me about two years to actually downstep it into terms that were universal, that everybody could understand, that didn't take a binary position on anything. And so what I want to do today is I want to talk about the anti-poverty work because this is really important for people to understand uh, the, how long this has been in the plan, what we're seeing going on today, um, and where we even may end up with that, um, the effect that it's had on low-income families and individuals in Canada. Uh, many people think Canada is just this wonderful little top hat to the United States, all middle class, and we all got jobs and free medical. Well, it is like that for some, but for many, sadly, it isn't, and I want people to see 
what the World Trade, uh, or the, what, sorry, what the New World um, Order has actually already done over the last 20, 30 years to bring about the objectives that we have today. Then I want to talk a little bit about how I switched gears, how I started receiving my download, and the actual program is called Quantum Health Transformation, and it's absolutely free. There are no strings attached whatsoever. It's over 20 videos. I'm very, very proud of the work because I labored. Uh, I just was, been, it's been a labor of love right from the get go. I'm so happy to uh, share this with the world and the feedback has been phenomenal. So what this actually means in a nutshell is the bad crop has been coming for some time. It's hit us, it's affecting billions of people, but it's not without hope because as Alfred knows, we're on a new positive timeline and the quantum health transformation program will help bring you into that new positive timeline where we can have paradise on earth. We can have peace. We can get to know our intergalactic brothers and sisters. There's nothing we can't do. I am, we're so full of power, it just gives me goosebumps talking about it. So if you can just bear with a bit of the history, then I'm gonna get into uh, some of the positive aspects and, um, and how we can still find peace, love, joy, health now, regardless of what's going on in the world. We can have that now. And when we start to subscribe to it and make it real in our lives, we're then enhancing and bringing in the new positive timeline, which is so wonderfully outlined in your book. Um, well, all of your books, but especially this last one, The Emergence of the Omniverse by Alfred. You are just such a wonderful author. I'm so happy that I got to read it. Um, so without any further ado, I'm just going to get into a little bit of my history now. So um, it started out with me being a very low income uh, single parent with two kids and just struggling to survive. And I had some really significant, terrible health issues that I don't really want to get into at this time. Um, and I couldn't work. And so I was in this catch-all low-income group that included everybody who basically, uh, I guess I would say around the hovering poor, the working poor, the um, people who couldn't work, um, you know, all, all, all the low-income people, what was going on. So I um, was... I did some volunteer work for the Women's Center in the Comox Valley. And they got um, information from a group called End Legislated Poverty, because poverty is absolutely legislated. And this group trained other anti-poverty activists and, and kept us informed, different anti-poverty groups. And I went down and I got my training in Vancouver um, with with the um, in legislated poverty, I went back to the Comox Valley and I started a group, um, a group called the Comox Valley um, Anti-Poverty Social Justice Group. That was the name of my group, and I worked together with women's centers and other anti-poverty organizations like TAPS, which is Together Against Poverty, out of um, Victoria and the North Island Women's Services Society. I was involved in all kinds of groups. And with what I learned, I went out and spoke to Council of Canadians and social planning groups and everything. And I ended up with this massive big anti-poverty group, which was people who were very low income and they wanted me to help them to get more money and, and to have the things they needed. And I was powerless to provide those things, but I could give them information. So what I did was I organized social just a, a social justice program so that we could all do something about it because we have been taught that if you don't like things the way they are then it's time to do things to change that so what kind of things did we do okay well first of all i i was educated we knew the the new world order was coming they had a series of summits started in 1975 
which was about 10 years before, uh, no, 15 years before I became an anti-poverty activist. And it started with about 20 of the largest economies in the world. Now, an economy is not the same thing as a country, although now we know that countries are also corporations. These are the largest corporation entities, economies on the planet that got together and said, okay, we want to roll out something new and we're tired of whatever's going on that's preventing them from making even more money and having more control over everybody. And these groups were meeting and they ended up, uh, then there was the G12 and then there was the G8 and finally it ended up with the G6, which was the six largest corporations in the world and they decided on how things were going to be to the point where they would tell all the rulers of the world what they wanted and everybody had to comply. So the first thing they did was they made it uh, a, new, a new system where they could roll back any laws that they wanted, any law, to suit their purpose. So we've made stri um, strides excuse me, in the last hundred years on things like understanding ecology of the planet, psychology, what people need to be healthy. Um, there was regulatory bodies to make sure that we weren't being poisoned by the products we were using every day, to make sure that food was, you know, edible and, and healthful. And there was all these things that now started to be rolled back. And they would be rolled back without us ever knowing that they had ever been rolled back. So we would think that they were still happening. We were still being protected. Another thing they did was they made it so that um, any country like, and especially Canada and the United States, could immigrate um, slave, a slave labor class. So in Canada, even today, we see a lot of the migrant farm workers and agricultural workers come in from other countries. Those people are, do not have to be paid minimum wage. They are basically slave labor doing work in Canada. So what that does is it um, breaks the unions, breaks, even though technically we have a minimum wage, if there are all these different groups that can come in and do work for less than that, that makes it more profitable for these um, big, large corporations that are uh, part of the um, making up the new world order. Um, they also want to make it so that um, uh, country boundaries are dissolved. And again, like I said before, they wanted to remove the environmental constraints so that they can do their, um, do their dirty business any way they want and pollute and cause homelessness and cause bad health and cause all these kind of things. Even today, um, people that are aware about health and nutrition, they buy organic foods, they buy foods that are supposed to be pesticide free. Well, now a lot of these foods are being brought in from other countries and there's being no tested. So someone that I knew from my anti-poverty work actually told me he worked at Customs, Canadian Customs, and all that the trucks had to do, the drivers would bring in paperwork that they would look over, stamp it, and hand them their big rolls of organic stickers for their fruits and vegetables. Nothing was ever even inspected. Nothing was even gone over. And now we're also finding out that a lot of this uh, so-called organic food is coming in from other countries like China, and they are not being tested. They are not being regulated. They're just calling it organic. So the, the systems and the things that we've come to trust throughout the years, the words are still there, but the, um, the um, um, checking things over to make sure they're really like that, that has all been eliminated. So we can see that, how that has led up to the situation that we're in today. So I want to now talk a little bit about what that actually means for millions of Canadians. Now, I'm sure this is also going on all over the world. But in Canada, you don't hear about it. It's been very suppressed. You do not hear about it. And so for most people who are middle class, 
or higher, they wouldn't even know that this has been going on for years. Just jumping back a little bit to when I went to university and took history of Canada, the things that we're finding out today that are really shocking people have been going on for hundreds of years from the point that Canada was, had uh, Western, or I shouldn't say Western, I guess European contact, whether it was with the Hudson's Bay Company, whether it was with how they dealt with um, the First Nations people, the genocide, the, um, the, re the re reservations that where they kept people um, who were um, um, native to Canada away from us. So we never got to know them or their culture. We never got to see them, all the segregation. In fact, a lot of Canadians were really horrified about apartheid in South Africa. Well, guess what? The folks from South Africa came to Canada to learn how to do apartheid, which has been alive and well in Canada almost from the get-go. And so people just don't understand that the world is not the way the media has informed them that it is. And so I want to talk about some of the noticeable problems that I witnessed myself or even experienced some of myself. One thing is I got my, I graduated with my degree in social work from the University of Victoria in 2004. The year that I graduated, um, they laid off over 30,000 social workers. So everybody goes, well, maybe that's a good thing. What do social workers even do? Well, I'll tell you what social workers did. Social workers were employed by many different nonprofit, governmental, and non governmental organizations because what they did was they were a midpoint between the first line people, the people who had mental or physical disabilities, people that had barriers to work, people who had violent home environments and needed to get away. Anybody that had a problem just stepping into a wonderful mainstream middle-class Canadian life, went to see a social worker. The social worker was then connected to all the other agencies, all the other supports that were out there. So the person would come in, see the social worker, and the social worker would go, okay, I'm gonna connect you up with some income assistance until you get on your feet again. We'll make sure you find you some decent housing. Um, we'll get you some food vouchers so you can go out and get some food right away for you and your kids. Um, you need some um, uh, addiction support. They arranged that. They arranged everything for everybody. Well, that got eliminated along with the core funding to many nonprofit organizations like anti-poverty groups, like women's centers, like human and women's centers, by the way, were in the process in the 90s of shifting over to human resource um, nonprofits because it became apparent that women weren't the only ones who needed some support. So um, this is all going on and um, but in I guess the 1970s they deinstitutionalized a lot of the um, 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 institutions that housed people with uh, mental disabilities and physical disabilities. Now, I'm not saying those institutions were good things. I'm not. But what I am saying is they took people who had been institutionalized all their lives and did not know how to take care of themselves um, on their own, didn't know how to fit into society, had been very heavily segregated all their lives, and now they were just turned out into the general population. Now, there are some group homes for those who can't function at all, can't feed themselves, can't clothe themselves. There are some what they call halfway houses uh, that are in residential neighborhoods that have qualified staff that look after them. But most of the people were just sent out and had no idea how to look after themselves and they became a large part of the homeless population. So another thing that happened is food banks. Now when food banks started happening, my alarms went off because that's what they did prior to World War II. So I noticed a lot of things that they were doing um, in society 
um, were mimicking things that they had done prior to World War II. And I went, oh my God, this is not good. And so as a recipient from the food bank, um, mostly what we received was stale donuts and highly processed carbohydrates and all the really garbage food that basically makes us sick and unable to think clearly and unable to look after ourselves properly. So um, I had a, one of my, I've had many, many wonderful spiritual experiences, but one of them was when my eyes were opened as to the abundance of food and medicine growing all around us for free in the plant world. And all these parking lots being sprayed with Roundup and everything is full of nutrition, full of medicine, full of things that we could be using. But there was no education around nutrition. There was no education around how to care for ourselves. There was no education around any of that. But one thing poor folks do get is socialized medicine. But what that really means is an unlimited supply of prescription medication. And so with every problem we had, be it depression because we couldn't feed our children or the slum housing we had to live in, which wasn't healthy and full of black mold, or all of those things. No, the only thing we were given was pills, pills, pills. And I got really sick on the pills. And everyone got really sick on the garbage food and on the pills. So I was aware, acutely aware, that we were part of long-term st drug studies. We were being experimented on. And it was really clear to me and really appalling to me. So what did we do to try to change this system? I could tell you horror story after horror story. I'll get back to a few of them, but let's just talk about what we did to try to change the system. Okay, we went out and spoke to other groups, like the Council of Canadians, like the social planning groups, things like that. We contacted politicians. I personally had a meeting with the um, Prime Minister of back in, in the 90s, who was Ujjal uh, Dosanjh, had a big meeting with him, had meetings with MLAs, with union representatives, anyone who would listen, we told everybody what was going on. Then we also did letter writing campaigns, and we did phone campaigns. This is really before very many of us had internet. We were just starting to get email at the time. And so we had what we called jam sessions where we got together and we jammed the government phone lines, phoning in saying, what well, we demand to know, what are you gonna do about this problem and that problem? So we did everything thinking, oh, the squeaky wheel is gonna get the oil. But you know what happened? Nothing happened. Things just got worse and worse and worse. And um, the other things they did was they stopped subsidized home care for the sick and elderly. So the elderly and sick people used to have someone that would come in called a home homemaker who would help prepare food, do some shopping, um, visit with the people, help them with their mental health, you know, all kinds of things like that to help them to have a better quality of life. All of that was removed. Um, they reduced social um, assistance. Um, a lot of disabled people who could not work were being forced into the sex trade industry and the drug trade industry because there was no other options available. Um, they removed um, um, all the talk therapies for mental health so that if you went to mental health, all you got was prescription drugs. If you didn't take the drugs, you got no service. You had to take the drugs to get service. And again, this is low income people, because if you had money, you could go and hire any therapist you wanted. So that also happened. And so they never brought everything they've taken away, they've never brought back. So nobody could even have someone to go in and just talk to about, about their about their their issues. And um, so um, just want to make sure I got everything. Yeah, so basically, that's sort of a, a look at what it was like. So for people who 
whatever they did for money, whether it was a bit of income assistance, whether it was sex trade, whatever it was doing, what people had to do to survive, um, ob often people couldn't afford, especially on the West Coast where rents are so high. Basically what happened is the lower mainland of the Vancouver area, there was when Hong Kong got um, shifted over from being independent to going back to China, it was a terrific amount of investment money came in from China. And so the, the Asian population in the lower mainland went up significantly and people got good prices for their homes. So they sold their homes and they all moved to the to like the um, the Okanagan or they moved to Vancouver Island because things were a little cheaper there they could get more for their money and people were then trying to retire so what happened is all the really good housing and everything you know went to the people who had the money the people that didn't have the money became the tenants of the middle class now um, I'm sure there are some very good uh, middle class landlords I'm not saying there aren't, but I am going to tell you what was more common. What was more common is people would buy these, um, put a suite in their basement, buy an apartment or a condo, or buy a little duplex, and then they would rent out, you know, rent it out to low income people thinking they're doing the low income people a really great service. But they didn't maintain their properties. They wouldn't invest the money into their properties to make them safe to make them the kind of place where low-income people could create homes. Instead, we just got these clusters of terrible low-income housing where the carpets were wet from leaking plumbing, black mold, mushrooms growing on the carpet. I could go on and on and on. <coughs> so this has been going on really since about, I would say it's been pretty devastating to low income people, I would say since about the 1980s, and well into the 1990s. So things just kind of got worse, and worse, and worse. And as people's health declined, um, you know, their problems, uh, all kinds of addiction problems, all kinds of problems that people face when they're stressed beyond what they can endure. So when you think about it, even in countries like Canada and the United States, there are many people who go to bed hungry. There are parents who go to bed hungry so that their children can eat. There are people who are so stressed because they have to choose between rent or food. And people don't even know that this condition, so it's like there's a second Canada that exists. So that was uh, sort of all the anti-poverty work I did, and none of it did any good. None of it. Hours and hours, so much energy. We thought we were going to change things, and things just got worse and worse and worse. Now, for me, <clears throat> what happened was I was very blessed to have a spiritual awakening. I had had a spiritual awakening that saved my life prior to becoming an anti-poverty activist where I had an amazing experience with Gabriel the Archangel and I found out that um, I could have support from non-corporeal beings to help me in the work that I wanted to do and make a difference in this world. But then after my anti-poverty work and after I had gotten my degree, I was unable to find work. I was under a lot of stress and I had another very profound spiritual awakening. And in that awakening, I started to have my experiences with um, extraterrestrials, with angels, with ancestors, with um, learned beings who once walked the earth and do not walk in physical form anymore. And I was astounded by what I was being shown and what I was learning. So then, um, a little bit later on, um, around, oh, after uh, the year 2000, especially 2012, I noticed there was a profound shift in reality that other people didn't seem to notice. They would talk all about this paradigm shift that was happening, but they were mostly stuck in dogma and in teachings of people and teachings of men. They didn't really seem to 
um, see, actually see that something was really different all over the world. Everything from what we were seeing in the sky to what we were sensing in our intuition, um, changes in our health, lots of things were going on. So after that was when I received my download and um, I got it, like I said, in an instant. Now, the reason I'm switching over um, to this subject now in, in this discussion is because I want people to know that there is hope. I want people to know that there is so much more than what we're taught is available in mainstream society. And that is very exciting to me. So um, if it's okay with you, um, Alfred, I'd like to just run over what the quantum health transformation program actually involves. I'm not going to get into details. I'm just going to give an, an overview. Did you have any questions about yeah, my anti-poverty yes, work before I, I shift? I do. Um, when, when this uh, downturn happened, when they started pulling back all of the social uh, support, and the, is that 30,000 social workers in British Columbia alone? Yeah, the year I graduated, 2004, 30,000 gone. 2004. Was that because there was a change in the government and a change in the philosophy of, of governing? What, what, are, what are the forces that are behind all of this at that time? Well, this is gonna be um, my opinion because I don't have fact sheets to show you. And I don't even know how accurate these fact sheets even really are. We're, we're living in a, in, a, in a fairly fluid reality, as I have found out. So no, what happened was it was very little. There was like little notices, little articles in the newspaper, but not much. Just kind of like, oh yeah, and by the way, 30,000 social workers have been laid off. There was no noticeable change in uh, the way society, government, Canadian life changed. There was no big revelation, there was no explanation, but myself and all the people who had anti-poverty background and who knew about the coming New World Order knew this was coming. And so it disempowered, beyond what they already were disempowered, it really disempowered millions and millions of Canadians and, and, and similar things happened in other provinces, but I'm only really can speak to my own experience of what I experienced while I was in BC. So as far as middle class people, it's the same like you try to talk to people today who are mainstream. Oh, you know, oh my gosh, 30,000 social workers. Oh, well, if the government thought to lay them off, then probably they weren't really serving a purpose or maybe they were abusing the system and getting extra money or people just thought the government, just like they're thinking today, oh, the government knows what it's doing. They would never do anything to harm us. They know more about these things than we do. Therefore, we're just going to carry on. So what happened is, um, I'll tell you, people who did experience some, um, some awareness were the people who worked at the nonprofits. So what happened is they, the core funding was removed from certain kinds of nonprofits that were really helping people, but other core funding remained. So groups like um, AIDS Vancouver Island is still heavily subsidized and funded by the governments. But what happened is that another trend, which I saw when I, after I, um, while I was getting my degree, I did practicums. I did a practicum at, um, in, at, sorry, at AIDS Vancouver Island in Victoria is where I did my practicum. And I saw things. I saw that the um, higher echelons within the organization, like the executive director and people like that, they, had, they made really good money. Plus, they were funneling money all the time to politicians to, to do what they called lobbying. And the programs were constantly being cut from the front line. So the front line workers were being laid off, had to move to being, um, you know, on call, casual work, so they didn't have to pay benefits, things like that. But I, I worked as part of a lunch program for people who were substance, um, 
users, um, people who had um, HIV, hepatitis, um, things like that, you know, pretty downtrodden sector of society, although we did, we were supposed to also be there for middle class and mainstream people who had the same issues, but really everything was cut to the poorest of the poor. They got tremendous amounts of funding for programs that were fictitious. So that's the other thing. The way it works in non, with nonprofit organizations is you make up a story of what you're going to do and how it's going to benefit citizens. And then you give it to the government. And if the government likes your dog and pony show, they give you funding. Once that funding comes into the nonprofit organization, they do what they want with it. There's no oversight to see if they actually did what they said they were going to do to bring the money in. So I had a bit of a falling out with AVI because I was uh, being trained to, um, they passed laws that nonprofit organizations could own profit making organizations. So it was my job to go and get all the training on how to make that happen for AVI. And, um, when I started to know too much, then they cut off my training and they cut off my supports. And eventually they just got rid of me. They didn't want me coming in anymore. Um, but there was no ever anyone ever answering uh, to the things that I was saying. And another example is food banks. So food banks, you know, I had to rely on them. And, and that's another thing. Eating at food banks and taking my prescribed medication led me to be a woman of over 320 pounds until I had my spiritual awakening because I was doing what the doctor told me. I was taking the meds and I was going and eating all the stale donuts and crap to fill me and my kids up. My kids end up with terrible weight issues as well. Um, we just really ended up in a terrible place. I've got all kinds of pictures I can send you if you want to see one out for now. There's a, there's a bit on my website and there's a bit on my um, Facebook page and on my YouTube channel. But anyway, um, once I had my spiritual awakening, um, all the weight went away and I learned how to eat properly. I'm going to get into the quantum health transformation in the next segment of this episode. Um, but did I answer your, your question? Yes. yes thank Alfred. You. Thank you. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> so anyway, I guess my guides, um, by the way, guides are not like really serious beings. Some are, but a lot of them have a bit of a sense of humor. They're very compassionate. They're very loving. They're very understanding. They are so fantastic to work with. And I really uh, encourage people to get out there and discover their soul team and their guides, which is also part of the, the course. So anyway, um, they started um, downloading this to me and I got it in an instant. It kind of totally blew my mind because it was so much information. And I had to think about how I was going to present this because I had to present it in a way that was, that was not dichotomous. So it didn't matter what your spiritual beliefs were. It didn't matter how old you were. It didn't matter how little or more money you had. It didn't matter what country you were in. It didn't matter what your uh, spiritual persuasion was. It had to um, be so universal that it could uh, appeal to everyone. And I was to put it on the internet. I had to get a website and create, oh my goodness, the adventures I went through and how all of this came to me. But everything came at, at every step as it was needed. It happened for me. So um, I, called the pro I called the program Quantum Health Transformation, which um, I, sometimes... Okay, I just want to say that in the mix of all of this, I had some really serious health issues. And so sometimes I may say, oh, I did this in 2014, but I actually did it in 2013. So I'm a little off on some of my time. So you'll have to forgive me for that. But um, considering what I've been through and what I had to face, boy, I'm, I'm doing really well. Thank God for that. Um, anyway, so the Quantum Health Transformation Program is nine steps. And it's divided, each step is divided into a three categories. So when I did it, I started with step nine. You do step nine before step eight, before step seven, before step six. And it helps to mess with our linear programming so we can start 
thinking and seeing and assimilating information a little bit differently. And so step nine, eight, and seven are about waking up your mind to seeing alternatives of reality that are there for any of us. And I tell everybody at the beginning of each lesson, do not run out and do what Karen says to do. Let this stimulate your own imagination, your own intuition, your own unique ways of doing and knowing. And add that to the mix. But let this be um, kind of a template to, let, to give you ideas on directions to go. So step nine is also called Introduction to Nubby Ball. And it's a conceptual tool that helps us to see the quantum reality. So instead of north and south, black and white, up or down, it's all the information between those two points. So if you look at a sphere, like a, maybe an image of the Earth, and you think of the North Pole and the South Pole, those would be the two extremes within a dichotomous way of thinking. So if we're going to think of black and white, black might be at the top, white might be at the bottom, but what about all the shades of gray, never mind the color spectrum, that also is included between those two points. So we've been in our brainwashing and in our programming, we've learned to dump all that information. So between good and, and evil, between all these different dichotomies, it helps us to see a sense of the whole. And when we start to see a sense of the whole, we stop being judgmental. We stop um, scapegoating other people. We take responsibility for our own sphere and our own life and all the things happening in there. And then the second part of step nine is teaches people how to do their own shadow work. Because we've been basically brainwashed into thinking, oh yeah, we're good, we're good all the time, we're in light, we're in love, how many people all preach the light and love and everything else, but you know what, we all have a shadow. So just like the earth has a north and a south pole, we also have the sun shining on one side, which casts a shadow on the other side, giving us day and night. And so I teach people how to use this conceptual tool to find their own shadow, what that might look like, and how to deal with the shadow. Because once we deal with the shadow, we've got more than twice the information. We have the information times the information, which is a, an exponential leap to the next level of understanding. And that's why I start off with this amazing conceptual tool I call the nubby ball. So the next step in the first third of the program is to introduce you, which is step eight, to all the technologies we don't even realize are technologies. Sunshine, grounding, positive affirmations, visualization, meditation, organ generators, which is, um, uh, I have a, a line of organ generators that I create that helps to support and fuel the work that I'm doing because this is um, pretty much an unpaid gig, um, helping people to transform themselves and transform the reality we live in. People can pay me to be their coach, but as in essence, the program is free and is totally doable uh, without having to hire me. So then the third step is male-female integration, understanding that our energy and one side of our body and one side of our brain is more male, the other one is more female, and how we it can integrate ways of knowing and ways of being to get more of a full potential, human potential happening for ourselves. And I also took a lot of um, courses that were... Um, Oh, let's just say they were more fringe courses, psychology, sociology, women's studies, which is now called gender studies. And in there, I learned um, all the bio, social, chemical reasons why there are so many transgendered individuals today. So I explained to them, people that don't have an understanding on why there's so many transgendered people, why that's happening, and also gives us a basis, again, for integrating our male and female side. So the first three steps, which I just covered, are all about opening your mind, breaking free from the construct. 
Then there's three, the next three uh, layers are uh, step six, step five, and step four. Nine, eight, seven, yeah, six, five, and four, which are all about detoxification because we have to detoxify. We have to detoxify our bodies, our minds, and we have to detoxify from the construct that we were born into. And so I teach people how to recognize products that are hurting their health, uh, cleaning products, personal care products, and how to make your own for pennies that work better than anything you could buy at the store um, to wake us up to how we can take good, better care of our bodies and stop adding toxic components to our physical body because this is the temple. This is where we funnel the energy from above and all around us, other realms, into us. We have to be able to hold the frequency in order to have meaningful connection with these with the omniverse and so um so i also teach people about food teach people about what is food what isn't food 99.9 percent .9 of the stuff they sell at the supermarket is not food it's dead it's lifeless and it's hurting us it's harming us and i teach people how to eat with respect to cultural background which means if you're an omnivore a carnivore, a vegan, a vegetarian, options for everybody so that they can start eating more healthful food, feed their body, which in turn also adds to detoxification and then ends up um, helping us to have a new level of health so that we can hold the frequency. And then the um, step four, uh, which is um, about detoxifying from a construct. So I teach people that words are symbols, where we live in a society full of symbols. Um, thoughts are symbols. Everything is energy. And how when we understand that, we can stay away from certain mind programming tools, like the television and mainstream um, TV, and a whole bunch of other ways that we can come to look at how we're being programmed, what it's doing to us, and how we can do it differently. Then there's three final steps, three, two, and one. Three, now that we've opened our minds, now that we've detoxified, now we can actually step into the omniverse. And so uh, step uh, three is all about how to manifest, but not just how to manifest your law of attraction, but how to manifest wisely to clear up our debt, improve our health, improve our family and friend relationships, the things that money can't even really buy, and how we can get rid of, well, I guess in a way you can, but um, how, how to... Um, um, open up our amazing ability to create. We're creative beings. We are of so much special interest to higher beings because we can do things they can't do. We can manifest. We can co-create with universal consciousness and we can bring about anything we want. So how exciting is that to learn how to do that? Then the step that is step two is all about how to build your own soul team, how to connect with your higher guides, how to build a relationship with them so that we're not working on our own. So how can Karen do all these amazing things? Because Karen's not working on her own. Karen's part of a team. And the majority of my team even me, you can't see, but it absolutely exists. So it helps people get started in that area. And then the very last lesson is step one. It's so simple and so beautiful. And it teaches people how to use basic virtue, virtues to be able to open interdimensional realities. And what people don't know about virtues is when we practice them, and I'll give you an example, patience. That's when I have to practice a lot. I work on it every day because patience, when I'm patient with people, my whole orientation and reality shifts. And I am now participating. I don't know if I shift to a different um, 
multiverse, a universe within a, mul you know, because there's the multiverse. I don't know whether I'm actually switching to another universe or whether I'm changing the one I'm in now. But damn, I'm powerful. We're like these amazing wizards and we can do all of these things. And so, like I said, this program is absolutely free. It's, um, I have, each step has at least two videos. So I have a slideshow primer and the primer is um, narrated. So if you're uh, blind, uh, you can listen to the program, or if you're too busy, you can listen to it. If you can't hear, you can read it. You can read along with the program. And everything has got illustrations, and I also give links. I don't make any money on any of my recommendations, well, except for my brand of organ generators. But besides that, I've just given people sources where they can get things that they might need to help them on their journey. Uh, from 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 companies that I, de I deal with and th that have shown that they have fantastic products and really good things. So in, in case someone doesn't know where to go, say to get their blue green algae, I give them where they can go to get a really good source of blue green algae, that kind of thing. I don't make any, any money off of anything. So, um, well, except for the organ generators. So each step has at least two videos. Uh, some of them are live workshops that I have done in the last few years where I'm working with a group of people answering their questions. Some are just demonstrations and some are just me chatting about, um, you know, in the other information that they might need. So there's at least two videos per step. Uh, that would be uh, 18, 18 videos right there, but then there's some extra stuff. I made a video um, with a fella from the Comox Valley who is uh, very knowledgeable about wild edible plants. So I made a, a video about that. I also have a video in there on how to make your own medicines from plant plants. And it, it, it can include cannabis, but it doesn't have to. Um, how people can make their own natural medicines and uh, there's just a wealth of information on there and I'm just so so delighted to tell people about it and um, I've had a lot of people contact me and say Karen you've helped change my life I cannot tell you how grateful I am for this program and I say well if you really like it just tell other people about it pass it on pass it on to other people so as this movement grows and, and mine is not the only way. Just some people might dig my way and they might dig Eckhart Tolle for another way or they might dig somebody else um, for another way. Like we all have different ways of teaching what we teach. And so you go, go with what resonates with you. And if there's anything in my program you don't like, just check it out the window. You know, it, it won't hurt you at all to go off on your own course and to discover your way, own way of doing it. And so um, I guess I got my website up around 2015. So for about the last, well, I guess five years, I've just been full time getting my program up to people, helping people, answering their questions and um, establishing myself on YouTube and um, establishing my son, myself as a merchant of fine organ generators and um, uh, just, I got to tell you, in the last year, things have really happened fast because I have learned to stay outside of my comfort zone. So this is another thing my guides taught me. I did not even know this was happening, but um, I realized because my guides pointed it out what I would do when I wanted to do something that I'd never done before. Um, my subconscious mind, in an effort to protect me, would give me my conscious mind the worst case scenario that could happen. Well, I didn't even know that was happening. So I would get an anxiety attack and then I wouldn't do it. But it wasn't until my guides showed me that I needed to work on that and challenge that within myself that I started going, okay, I'm feeling the fear and I'm gonna do it anyway. So I started um, going on other people's shows. I started my YouTube channel. I started making all kinds of videos about all kinds of things. And in the last year, my life has changed so much. I did not see this coming, but I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm pretty happy. I'm getting healthier all the time. I'm making some incredible friends. My life has never been so rewarding. And all of that, in spite of, and in addition to, 
all the crap I talked about on the first half of your program uh, about what was going on. So just, they only know what they've been trained and we can go inside and find an amazing array of internal uh, support and information. And that is the emergence of the omniverse happening all in the same, in the same milieu. So do you have any questions, Alfred? Uh, well, that that was quite the quite <laughs> the force there. Uh, you know, at first I just want to acknowledge your amazing work. Uh, well, let let me get to the basics. How does one access all of this amazing work? I mean, we'll 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 have it, of course, in the article accompanying this interview and in the video description but just verbally, could you tell us how one can access this amazing work? Yes, I have worked uh, for five years on my website and I was really excited that last year I got some funding. So I got to learn how to do my own website. So I completely ripped it all apart and redid it, learned how to do it. So I've done ev everything that's on there, all the videos, all the pictures, all the words, everything I've done myself, uh, even the going in and putting it all on my website, everything I learned how to do. And I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, and so I would um, first direct people to my website. And my website is www.karenholtonhealthcoach.com. And that's K-A-R-E-N-H-O-L-T-O-N, healthcoach.com. I'm a different kind of health coach. Um, but uh, that was when I had to find my domain name, that was as close as I could come without a big, big, long, long name to try to make it as short as possible. And when you go onto my website, you'll see um, there's several ways to access the information. You can click on any of the pictures and they'll take you in like a portal to where you want to go. And there's also a menu across the top. And so one of them is my shop where, um, where I sell orgone generators that are my own unique line. I sell um, um, crystals and I also sell PDFs. So although the Quantum Health Transformation Program is free, if you want the full color PDF version of each step, which by the way, you can feel free to copy and share to your heart's content, because this is about getting the information out there, not my ego. So, but they're only $3.99 Canadian. So for anyone who wants to buy those. And um, I also have a free resources tab. Under the free resources tab is, um, my quantum health transformation complete program tons of videos on all kinds of things all my guest appearances on other people's shows all the articles i've written and had published in um, um in magazines global uh one of them is um sybil magazine for the spirit and soul of woman which is an international magazine so 12 articles um, from there. Everything is in there. Um, I also have an About tab if you want to read a little bit about my history. Uh, if you want to read a little bit about my parent company, which is called Vancouver Island Alternative Lifestyle Services, or VIALS for short. Uh, I know it's funny now because I live in Red Deer, Alberta, but um, most of the work I did was on Vancouver Island and it worked, so I just kept the name. Um, yeah, it's lots and lots of information, everything you could want. Now, I also have a YouTube channel, which is uh, uh, youtube.com backslash C backslash Karen Fulton TV. And um, uh, everything is on there as well, uh, as well as some really cool playlists. Like, for instance, I have a playlist uh, called The Nature of Reality, where I've collected different videos uh, from YouTube that explain the nature of reality. For instance, um, what six or five dimensional reality looks like on a three dimensional plane. Um, all the things that I can do with my guides explained in a four part series, uh, which I 
I didn't give credit to the people who made it because I, I don't know who made it. I don't even know where I got it from, but it was important enough to, to post on YouTube with a clear, um, a clear disclaimer that if I knew who did, who, who did these interviews, I would very gladly give them credit. Anyway, it's the science of, of reality and it has all kinds of stuff like, for instance, how we um, communicate uh, with other um, beings, um, perhaps millions of light years away, is we do it because we are able to produce biophotonic energy. And each chakra is sort of primed to a different frequency and a different wavelength and a different speed, which again goes back to preparing the body temple so that we can hold the frequency. So all the really nerdy, nerdy science stuff is, is also on my YouTube channel. And then of course I'm on Facebook and I've got four Facebook pages. Quantum Health Transformation is the one that relates mostly to health and lifestyle. I've got um, also um, <clears throat> vials, which is sort of for people of alternative realities already that want things that feed their soul. I've got Zendome's Orgo Organite, which is all about my organ generators. And by the way, I also have a lot of videos on how they work, which I've, I've made myself because I could not find good information anywhere on YouTube uh, about organ generators. And most of it was just people that loved it, but they didn't, they didn't really kind of get into the science on how they work. So I've made all kinds of videos on on how they work, and uh, yeah, I've been I've been I've been a busy a busy woman. It keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> keeps me from feeling sorry for myself for sure to be this active. Right. But I'm just so grateful to bring it to everybody. You, you know that my my second question is this, and for those who may not know, what is an orgone generator? How does it work, and what does it do? Okay, I'm gonna just happen to have one right here that I'm gonna show you. This is a little orgon generator. And what an orgon generator is, it's a combination of a shape. So when you do the research on the pyramid shape, I have some that are not pyramids, but I'm giving you this as an example. Pyramid means fire in the middle. So energy is absorbed through the bottom and comes out the top, but it is amplified at the halfway point and uh, just before the tip, it gets amplified and amplified and comes out the top. And so the ambient energy around us, whether it's somebody who gives off a nasty vibe, electro, any kind of electromagnetic frequency like um, the stuff that our Wi-Fi is made out of and our smart meters and our cell phones and our computers and actually anything electronic, even if it uses batteries, whether it plugs into the wall or not, produces an electromagnetic frequency. We do too. Every cell in our body does as well. Well, what this does is it absorbs that ambient energy through the bottom this particular one has a layer of different kinds of crystals. It retunes that frequency. It downsteps it into the frequency of the crystals. So it retunes it from something that has a very short, narrow bandwidth or oscillations uh, between pulses to something our bodies can recognize, which has those beautiful, long, lanky, slower wavelengths which is what the human body needs. I, I could get into Schumann resonance and everything else, but we'll save that for another time. So another thing that this organ generator is doing is all of the crystals that are in them are what they call piezoelectric, which means that when they're under pressure, they become electrically polarized and they start to emit an actual electrical charge and an electrical frequency. And so that's where we get orgone. Now, orgone is also known as chi, prana, etheric energy, holy spirit, right? Where does it come from? Well, inside the crystals, it's helical like our DNA. And like our DNA, which draws from zero point, 
and that's how we're able to create and manifest okay these little guys all become polarized they start to uh, vibrate and emit an electrical frequency and they start to pull from zero point and put that also into the mix which comes firing out the top this one has a clear a triple a clear quartz um point on it which helps to amplify and purify it as there's huge science behind it. i've done a, a lot of research i've made a lot of videos about how how they work so they produce orgone and then as i mentioned before symbols also emit energy so the symbols that i use i'll, get, I'll show you another one this one here is beautiful this one is um this, oh yeah peridot this one's peridot it's a beautiful green one okay this one has um metatron's cube symbol on the front the other one had the flower of life metatron is the archangel who mediates the energies between heaven and earth so that is affecting also the orgon so the crystals are retuning the electromagnetic frequencies the symbol also um, gives influence and then the crystals are also producing orgone energy and what's even better than that i'm the only one that can do this because my guides taught me how not to brag but i'm awfully i'm awfully glad i've got them i don't know what i'd do without them but they taught me how to do a process of quantum entanglement so what i do is i imbue each and every one with a process and an intention the process includes being out in sunshine um washing and cleansing and sanitizing smudging um playing high frequency music um and then i place them in a grid along with pieces of orgon uh, organite which is the kind of the term for orgon generators and i take some crystals that i have done a lot of ritual with and this has nothing to do with the religion or anything this is just me what i do is i take a wand i tap into and ground to mother earth i bring in the energies from the earth i tap into the universe and i bring in the energies from the universe i mix them in my body because my body is a vessel and i concentrate them in my heart chakra then i send that energy overflowing out down my arms out my fingers through my wand into my organite and so what i do is i imbue them with the intention of working to the highest good of the receiver because i don't know why somebody is going to order my organite it could be for anything it could be because they want to clean the air it might be because they want better relationships it might be because they want to bring um more spirituality into their life it could be for a health issue i don't know but if it works to the highest good of the receiver it's going to do its job for whatever you do so you receive the orgone generator in the mail and then what your intention is it picks up and then it, it actually will do it but even more than that they're all linked so every piece of orgone i've ever had that I have now or ever will have are all linked. So in that way, they go out into the world. And so whether they go to Memphis, Tennessee or Alaska, or they go to Thailand, no matter where they go, they're actually spreading an invisible grid around the earth to pass on love, light, peace, harmony, all the beautiful, beautiful intentions that I've imbued into them. And so as they go out, they're forming a grid and they're helping bring about planetary and uh, I guess spiritual change to the whole planet, which is happening like gangbusters right now. So I, I'm pretty excited about this and I create them, but I don't make them. I have two friends who make them for me and we're all little home-based businesses. There's none, no factories, no big business, nothing, just people in our own little homes doing our own little thing. Um, and this year, I also came out with two brand new products that my guides uh, also gave to me. One is an alien implant remedy uh, kit, and the other one is called Evil Be Gone. And they work very similarly because evil attachments and alien implants all work by producing an electromagnetic frequency. So whether you have um, 
whether your implant is physical, whether it's um, interdimensional, whether it's holographic, whether it's genetic, we've been messed with over time by quite a few different kinds of beings at different levels of reality. And what this does is it uses very high frequency uh, through specific essential oils, crystals, and orgone and intention, to, and also a guided meditation that you do every, every day for 21 days. What that does is it, inact, it deactivates them. And once they're deactivated, they stop producing the electromagnetic frequency and our body can get rid of them. So um, that's how, how it works. And I did somebody else's um, alien implant removal process oh, around, oh, around maybe 2016, and I found a huge difference. And so I worked with my guides, and actually I did a, a, an off-world trip to the big ship that I, uh, I is my, my second home in some ways, it's like my first home. But I went there while I was there doing some ambassador work. Um, I got together with some of the other beings and they said, Karen, you gotta tell people about alien implants because they're really holding people back. And they're fairly simple to remove, but you have to do it energetically so that you're deactivating frequency with frequency. So it's all been very, very exciting. Uh, my life is, very interesting. And I'll tell you, I'm no good at small talk. I go and I go over to the mall and I get into, I talk to everybody. I get into a conversation with one of the, the local people from Red Deer, Alberta, and I scare the hell out of them. Like, and, and I'm not very good at um, censoring myself because I'm passionate about what I believe in. It's been a real trip being in Red Deer, Alberta. Um, and passing this information on to people but uh yeah so that's that's what the organ generators do so my friends make them and i sell them and then the money that i i make i don't make a lot because they're expensive to make when you want to make them properly and i want to keep my prices low because what good are they if no one can afford to have them in their homes right and um so um yeah, so that's that's what i do we're just little, little we're all little home-based businesses none of us is big the reason we're not big, I guess, is because we were each one of us that's involved in making them and anyone that's involved with my company, they're all people who sincerely want to evolve, sincerely want to bring about peace, love and harmony to this planet. It's not about making money because you see, if we really have our spirituality and our bodies working properly, we can have anything we want. And then you go, oh, well, you know, I don't, I don't want a bunch of junk that I have to insure, maintain, look after, use, worry about people stealing. Like, life becomes just simpler. <laughs> right, right. Now, uh, I have one other question, and it's this. You, you keep on talking about your guides. Yeah. And uh, I don't know whether you want to leave that to part two or you want to talk about that now, or maybe you have a glimpse now and then go more deeply in part two, what? Okay, I'll give you a little taste of it. And then when I come back in two weeks, I'm going to just deal with my guides and in particular, the um, Intergalactic Resettlement Program. And I gotta tell you right off the top, you're not going to see a big mothership show up and everybody get on board and get taken somewhere else. It doesn't work like that. It works. It's a frequency based movement and it has to do with us raising our frequency. So detoxifying, um, building up our body with, with biologically appropriate foods and activities, um, us making our life over so that we're not schmucks all the time. I know we all think we're running around in the light all the time, but boy, we are, except when we're not. And we need to face our shadow and, and, and integrate our shadow. And that, again, everything changes our frequency. Every cell of our body has a unique frequency. Um, it's really cool, you know, on the ship that where I go, we have healing chambers and they use frequency. That's how, how we're healed. That's how we're healed. Anyway, it's very interesting because oh, there's many different ways of 
accessing different kinds of beings, corporeal and non-corporeal. There are many different cultures. And I really, really was fascinated with the cultural information. So like, for instance, I will tell you next time about the mothership, what it looks like, what the orientation process is like, who you meet, how do you go to the bathroom, um, what do people do for fun and entertainment, how do we get our training in, what types of resettlement are possible, and what that involves. It's so amazing that I got to tell you, it's really a struggle to come back into three-dimensional earth reality and, you know, make sure I vacuumed recently and been shopping and remember to send a birthday card to my daughter. Like, to get back into three-dimensional earth living is a challenge because it's so beautiful. But then I also have another being Okay, so the beings on the ship look very much like us, Alfred. Very, very much like us. Culturally, they're very different, but they're very much uh, like us. I have another being who's actually higher dimensionally, who I don't see in person. And I call him Bob because he said that's what I can call him. I would never be able to say his real name. A lot of them don't even have real names. They have aspects of where they're from and maybe their core personality and something they like kind of combined into a concept rather than a name, right? Anyway, so Bob is really cool. Bob looks quite a bit like a stereotypical gray, um, but he has the best sense of humor. Oh my God. Like we think of these things as being drones and they come to earth and they take people and they do experiments and this and that. Well, yeah, maybe some of them do, because I personally have had so many interesting experiences. I would never discount anybody's experience. I think they're all real. But Bob, um, he accesses um, a link with me that I can talk to him anytime I want. And he's so cute. Like, for instance, before I did my... Um, um, my presentation at the Forbidden Knowledge News Con, I was trying, I was doing, I wanted to have more about him in there. And I said, Bob, I want to get a better sense of what you look like. And I was, I know this sounds funny. And a lot of this, I can't even describe properly in human terms, but I'm able to really focus my um, imagination, I guess you would call it. I'm able to really focus and I'm able to get a fairly clear picture of of what different beings look like if they have bodies. So I knew what Bob looked like, but I wanted to get in closer and really see his face. And you know what he did? They're so cute because they don't want to scare us too. He's so cute. What he did was all of a sudden he flashed the image of a big human smile onto his face. And I kind of went, whoa. And then I laughed and he laughed and he did it because he was trying to be funny because he doesn't want to scare me. He doesn't want to scare anybody, right? And Bob's really cool because he has this retro thing with earth nostalgia and some of it he doesn't get right. So anyway, uh, he's pretty cool. He likes, believe it or not, Frank Sinatra and Michael Jackson. And to him, they're kind of very similar kind of performers. To us, not so much, but to him, they're very similar. And sometimes he even wears a fedora. I know this sounds completely stark raving lunatic. Lock me up. I understand how it sounds. But the reality is, this is my reality. And this is, this is who the kind of beings that I have contact with. Anyway, Bob also facilitates um, information for me. So like, for instance, I'm sure he's the one that got me my job as an exopolitical ambassador on the big ship. And when I, and I, and the other thing too, is they do erase our memories and it's not like psychological rape or anything like that. You agree to it. You, you understand the reasons why the memories are white because there's millions of, of us, Alfred. This is not Karen's the only one having this experience. Millions of us on earth today because it's part of, of, of the work that needs to happen for this so-called time. That's another issue when we talk about time. But um, um, so anyway, sometimes I'll say to Bob, Bob, how come I can't remember, um, you know, how we cooked our food? 
how come I can't remember this and that? And Bob says, you really want to know? And I have to lay down and I have to put myself into kind of a, um, a very calm meditative state. And then it's like watching a movie. And then I remember, I remember being on the ship and I remember what we did and I remember how we took our meals and I remember, oh yeah, right. And then it's so clear and then I, I write it down. So I'm looking forward to doing some more, uh, some more uh, information. I'm going back to um, Forbidden Knowledge News Con next year. I'm going to go more into the relationships I have with the ultra terrestrials. So the ultra terrestrials are not necessarily physical. So they could include angels. Um, they could be um, um, uh, earth people who lived at one time. Um, for instance, I got some strategy advice from Sun Tzu. I thought that was extremely cool. And you're always blown away because you can't believe these beings are actually going to talk to you or communicate with you. Like, who am I? I mean, yeah, I did some anti-poverty work and, and I did my best raising two uh, amazing human beings as my, who are now my grown children. I really don't have anything to say, oh, I'm so great and grand. Not at all, right? And um, which is another reason why I'm perfect. In the beginning, I used to always say to them, why me? I am your worst choice. And they said, Karen, you're our best choice because we know exactly what you're going to do. We know you're going to come through for us. You know, we know you're going to handle the information. I had to have a few years of training where they really taught me this is, I can't make this about a religion. I can't make this dogma. I can't make this about me. This has to be um, a fairly fluid thing that I pass on to people so that they can grab it and then manifest their own and, and get going with it. So there's that, there's the angels. My life was saved by uh, Gabriel, the archangel. Uh, because I am so sensitive, um, I pick up energy from everything and everybody. It's very difficult for me to have a normal life. It's difficult for me to be around people who are closed-minded or very angry or hurtful. It's very hard for me to be around um, certain kinds of energy. And I, I moved, I'll just tell you quick, I moved into this uh, little uh, place and I, unbeknownst to me, the man who lived there before me had committed suicide there. And I picked up um, how he did it. And I was going to kill myself the same exact way. Wasn't until two years later, I found out from a friend who knew someone who was the mother of the guy that lived in the house before me, that that's how he had succumbed. And so you see, I had picked up that imprint. This before I found out about Organite or anyone knew about it or anything like that. So, so then Gabriel, uh, the Archangel came to me one night and said, you know, if you want to go, you're allowed to because we're allowed exit points. When life gets so crud and some really crappy stuff happened. I don't get into a lot of the crap. Like one day I'm going to make some videos about what happened to me. And, and it was really bad, really, really bad just as bad as what's going on today. But, uh, but I'm, it's not about, I don't want people to be emotionally um, um, intrigued because of my bad experiences. I want them to hear the good things. And the fact that I've survived and I thrive and that I'm evolving and that I'm doing this amazing work is testimony that we can come through anything and surpass it that there is no limit except for the ones we put on ourselves. And hopefully quantum health transformation is going to help a lot of people break, break free from that. I'm sorry, I ramble on and on and on. And I don't, I don't even remember the original question. Um, Alfred, is there something else you want to ask me? Well, that, that was a very good introduction to your guides. And we, we really look forward to, to part two. I, I'm just totally sitting here in <laughs> awe and amazement. And uh, I'm so grateful that, that you decided to share this with us. Um, and uh, uh, I urge people to go to karenholtonhealthcoach.com. Yep, and also um, um, you can actually purchase my, my two hour presentation that I did from Forbidden Knowledge News Con uh, from their website. Uh, they're not expensive at all. Um, if anybody wants to see it, I will eventually uh, produce it in maybe a four part series uh, because it's really important. I really want people to understand this is very real. 
and this is available to everybody. This is not, I haven't done anything special to have, to, do, to have this happen. Um, well, maybe, but I don't think so, really. Um, but um, I'm going to also send you the PDF of the full presentation so that you can look it over, Alfred, and get a gist of what kinds of things I'm going to talk about. If there's any aspect of that you don't think is appropriate for your audience, you know, feel free to, to let me know because I do get into, um, I, 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 I get it. But, I'll just give you a little snippet. Okay, in that particular presentation, I get into um, the sexual practices of some non-human humanoids. But you got to understand sex is a very different thing there. Uh, it can be used for reproduction, but it is more of a spiritual thing. It is about um, the kind of spiritual ecstasy that humans have experienced. It's more about that than it is about physical bodies doing stuff together. But that may or may not be appropriate for your audience. So you can let me know after you, after you look, up, look at that. Because um, it, people got to understand things on earth are so screwy. We were never meant to live the way we live. We were never meant to have the kind of societies that we have. Well, some very, what we would consider primitive, which I would consider advanced societies still exist, which would be, you know, um, cultural groups of people who have not had interactions with the colonizer, right? So there are maybe some groups in South, South America or maybe, and they would be right on line with, 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 um, with culture that is from other planets. It's really interesting for the mainstream colonized world that we accept as a mainstream reality. No, nah, no one does it like this. This is just a way to keep people from realizing their true potential and taking our place in this amazing reality with our spiritual and ET brothers and sisters. This is a really positive thing. And I want everybody to know about it. I, I, you, you hear a lot of the kind of nuts and bolts ET people is tell, talking about their experiences. And I'm real sorry those people have had some negative experiences. But they got to understand that is low frequency groups dealing with low frequency humans. Uh, there's nothing to do with the untapped, uh, unlimited potential we have in the omniverse. And, and that's why I'm so grateful to you, Alfred. And for the books you produce, because the information you produce for people is completely different than what I do. But we're coming at it from the same ball, maybe different sides of the same ball, which is wonderful. And, and I'm finding out that so many of us are all, we, got, we all got a piece of the, the animal. One's got an ear and one's got a tail, but we're all definitely um, part of the same thing. And it's wonderful. And it, it gives people a chance to think happy thoughts and to be excited, and to learn to care for their bodies. This is such an amazing technology, the human body, what we've been given. Even those of us with bodies that maybe don't work 100% as well as they could, it is amazing what we can do. And I just can't shut up about it. So I'm very, very grateful that you've had me on your show. And I guess that's about it for today. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. And Anything that comes up in the chat or comments, you know, we could also maybe get into uh, in two weeks when I see you again. Well, thank you very much. And, and you've really inspired, I know, me today. And I'm sure those who are, who are watching and we look forward to our next coming together. Me too. Good enough then. Okay. Thank you so much, Alfred. What a great opportunity. And it's been really lovely to see you again. Take good care of yourself. Absolutely. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.